years ago on the uh, very first time we took our youth on a little youth trip. We all fit in one little car. And if I remember right, there was two adults and four kids. And one of them was a sweet little kid, but he was a little bit, all I can think to say, scatterbrained. He's a little guy. And we've been on this canoe trip <coughs> for hours. I think about halfway through. And he looked up at me and he said, when are we going canoeing? I said, son, we've been canoeing for hours. And the reason that I'm saying that right now is some of you saying, Lord, when's going to have revival? Because you've got a picture of something, and it may not be what God's got a picture of. But see, I've been hearing of people. Some of you have been coming to me one at a time. You've been telling me things. You, God's been stirring up old things. See, you think revival is something new. Maybe it isn't. Maybe it depends on something old getting stirred. Re means again. I mean, I was a trucker at one time. Re-tread means it had tread. It lost tread and got more tread. Amen. Revival means viva, viva la France. If you're a musician, vivace means lively. Revive maybe means you've been vived again. Amen? Amen. So if you're sitting there going, when are we going canoeing? Lord, when are you going to send revival? Let me ask you something. What if it's here right now? What if it's here for you to grab a hold of right now? What if... What if what God wants to do could begin in you before you leave this place? And what if God's work in you would never end? And you'd look back and say, I started tonight, last night. It started. I don't know when, but I know it's going on and it's going and going and it's going on. What if, what if, what if? See, I'm not just talking to you. My heart's just doing things. I can talk without my heart doing things, but I can't make my heart do things. I'm telling you, God's talking to us. What if this is it? You know, I started at the very beginning of my Bible today. I went back to page 11 (coughs) because they had a whole bunch of stuff before the Scripture really started. And it was in Genesis chapter 2 and 3 and I'm not going to spend a lot of time with it except to say, did did you know that when God made man, God used to walk with him in the garden? God used to talk to him. And and God said, hey, it's really not good that you're alone even though I'm here and made him a helpmate. And man, oh man, it really was heaven on earth. And then you know what happened. They did the one thing God said don't do. And we've been in a pickle ever since. But God's heart ever since then has longed for revival. God's heart ever since has longed to see restored in the earth what he once had and what he has lost because we threw it away. And so the revival that you think you're looking for you got to understand God has been looking for a long time. And do you know what he needs? He just needs somebody to say, it's me. Take me. If you can take the church, take the church. If you can take the state, take the state. If you can take the nation, take the nation. But if all you can take is one, then here I am and I want it more than my necessary breath and I'm not going to quit believing until I have it. God come into my life take over my heart. Help me to step over this God awful self will that's in there and help me to walk with you in the beauty of holiness and let it begin now. 
what if, what if that's available to you tonight? What if it's available to you tonight? I tell you, I appreciate the way you come to me before the service and tell me wonderful things. And I appreciate the way you come to me at the end of the service and tell me wonderful things. But I'm going to ask you to do something tonight, and I hope they don't throw me out for it. But I'm going to ask for you to respond during the message, okay? If God helps you, I want you to just twitch or something. I want you to raise a hand, or I want you to poke the person next to you, or I want you to say amen, or I want you to respond. See, that's a head nod. Thank you. We're getting started. Amen. Amen. I'm not asking you to get rowdy. I'm not asking you to be silly. I'm not asking you to be goofy and do things to bring attention to yourself. But I'm saying if something hits you, if something helps you, well then I, I might say something like that helps me or something like that. I don't know. What I'm asking you to do is just respond. I don't need, it's not for me. If you start responding to God, I mean, I mean, I mean, and God will respond. Let me ask you something. you got a little child. You give them a new bicycle. They go, okay, whatever, thanks. Okay? What if you got that same child? I'll tell you, this is a true story. My son, he was so thankful. We gave him a new bicycle. And he said, oh, Dad, he said, oh, Dad, oh, Dad, oh, Dad, it's a one speed. <laughs> it's the truth. He was so thrilled it's a one speed. What if, what if you and I become like that, like little children? Just so happy, just so thankful, just so glad, just so grateful. What do you? What would your heavenly Father do with you if you're stirred over a one speed? What would He do? He might give you more. He might give you more and give you more and give you more. And if you keep giving thanks, if you keep giving praise, if you keep giving Him credit, if you don't get your glory mixed up with His, okay, you get low and you lift Him high. If you keep that up, if that becomes a habit, if that becomes a pattern, what do you think could happen in your life? What do you think? And I don't know. It's just something to think about. The fellowship that Adam had was lost because of sin. And sin brings, sin, sin brings darkness, sin brings despair, sin brings trouble, sin brings a mess. Adam found it out, Eve found it out, and every person that's been born since has lived with a longing and a yearning, just like God has lived with a longing and a yearning for things to be restored. And that scripture that we sang a minute ago, we got, there, there are a lot of songs tonight I didn't know, but I didn't care. I mean, I'm singing and making up harmonies. I'm doing whatever I can because that's what you need to do. If God's leading it, it doesn't matter if it's your favorite or you know it. You just need to dig in and, and bear down. And that's what I was doing. And I was blessed tonight. I was blessed. I was blessed. I was blessed. And a lot of them I didn't even know, but it didn't make any difference. I, was, I didn't sing in the microphone if I didn't know it. But I'm telling you, and would you, that song that, said, that started out, God who knew no sin became sin. Oh, man. That's been on my heart today, the fact that God, when there was no way to ransom you and no way to ransom me, Isaiah said that our sin had caused a separation between us and God. And you, it was a separation that couldn't be crossed. It was a chasm. It couldn't be guessed. And so God says when there was just no other way, and we searched the earth, see if there's somebody righteous, man, there wasn't even one, not even one. When there was nobody who could fulfill the law, if there was nobody could, could snuff the curse, God sent his son, his only son, and he took the rap for all of us. He became sin. The one person who shouldn't have had to have done that. The one person who never sinned. Who didn't even know what it felt like to sin. He not only took on sin. He took on all of the sin of the whole world. Amen. And nobody understood it. 
Nobody stood with him. His own disciples left him and stood back at a distance and they took him away and they beat him mercilessly. They beat him beyond so much that the scriptures talked about way before it happened in Isaiah that that you wouldn't even recognize him. He said he took on a form that was so, so ghastly that you couldn't look at him. If you'd been there and you knew him, you couldn't look at him. He would have been so destroyed in his features and so swollen, so bleeding. You couldn't have looked at him. I couldn't have looked at him. He knew it was going to happen, and he'd let it happen anyway. When Peter said, no, no, may it never be, he said, get behind me, Satan. He wasn't, he wasn't calling, he wasn't calling Peter Satan. He was just saying, Peter, I love you, but you talk sometimes before you think. And Satan's using you, Peter, hush a minute, hush a minute. What can I do? Can I turn from this? Look who's going to be lost if I turn from this. And he could look, he could look in eternity. He saw me and you and everybody that's ever been and everybody that's ever going to be. The Bible says that he had his eyes set on the joy set before him. And because of that, because of you, because of me, he endured that cross. And the Bible says he didn't even know what the shame was just a shame. He just despised it. He said, I'm not even going to consider it. And you know he went into hell itself. You know that he took the keys to sin and death. You know that he rose again. And you know that he's in heaven right now praying for you and me that he can have that connection with you and me that he once had with Adam and he once had with Eve and he hadn't had with hardly anybody since. What if you're standing at the door And he's on the other side of the door. And he's longing today. What if today's the day that he's longing for you to just lay aside every sin, every weight, everything, every encumbrance? What if saying I'm sorry is the key that opens that door? What if it is? Reverend Helm told a story, a mentor, my mentor, told a story about a man who for who years and years and years ago they took up an offering in the church and they used his derby okay now how long has it been i mean i'm 62 and i've never even seen anybody wear a derby unless it's a rock band or something like that then they took his hat a derby and they took they took an offering in the church and he took the money out and gave it gave, gave it to the church and years later he remembered that a nickel had been stuck up under the hat band uh, and he he took and he brought that nickel back to the church years and years and years later and repented of it and said he was sorry and God brought revival to the people because one person, one person had one thing that wasn't right and they repented of it and and God used that one thing to bring revival to a people. What if that person is you today? Can I ask you something? I haven't started preaching yet. This is just an introduction. Are you, are you sitting there? Are you sitting there unhappy with somebody? Is there anybody that you couldn't pray for with a clear conscience? Is there anybody? Is there anybody that's hurt you? And if you could, you'd knock them into Tuesday. And then repent of it. Is there, because if you're, if you're sitting there like that, you need to know something. You're a chalk against the wheel. You're a chalk against the wheel. God wants to move and it won't move because of you. You say, preacher, you're skinning me. I don't know who you are. It may not be anybody. You and I. A pastor called me, a friend of mine. He's an old man. He can't get around anymore. His legs don't work. He just, <coughs> he's, he, Pastor Paul Cox is who I'm talking about. And I called him and I asked him to pray that God would help in these meetings, that God would, God would help me not to say the, do the wrong thing, that I could be somehow an instrument in the hand of God. He called me today at, at 9.10. 
He said, I've been wanting to call you since 1215 last night. And God wouldn't let me until right now. He said, I was sitting on my bed praying for these meetings and praying that God would move in the hearts of the people. And he said, while I was sitting there, he said it was like God himself walked in the room. And if you know him, he doesn't just say things like that. In fact, I've never heard him say that. And he said, God's been telling me that if the people will repent, that he'll send revival. And repent means to say, I'm sorry. Confess just means to tell God what he already knows, duh, and say, I'm sorry about it. That's all confession is. He said, if people will repent tonight... Now, see, I don't know of anybody that needs to repent of anything. I'm not, I don't, I'm not thumping some drum that I know about because I don't. But if there's anything in your heart against anybody, Jesus said, hey, if you're there presenting your offering at the altar and there remember that your brother has something against you, leave the offering, leave the church house, go back and get that straight with your brother, then come back, then your offering will be acceptable. And so I just want to encourage you tonight. I've never seen revival. I need it as badly as you do. I have never seen it. I've heard about it. I got saved in what they were calling a revival. And I got revived. But I've never seen what we're praying for. I've never seen it myself. I long to see it. I want to see it. And I know that God longs to see it. Because God wants a people who are revived and renewed. He wants somebody that he can trust to come into their heart, into their lives with the kingdom of God. He wants, like the old words of the hymn, and he wants walks with me and he talks with me and he tells me I am his own. Those words were written when? I don't even know. A long, long time ago. The old timers knew what I'm telling you now. The old timers knew about it. And I want it. And I want to see it. And I believe with my heart, I believe that we can see it tonight. If we will just not be proud anymore, if we will say, God, if there's something that's a chalk against what you're doing, and if it's me, then I am willing to do whatever I've got to do to make things right and see your kingdom come, and at last, your will be done in the earth. Amen? Amen. Amen. Now I'm going to ask you, I'm going to, I'm going to put you right on the spot when you raise your hand. If God shows you something that's in your heart, needs to be taken care of, will you respond? Raise your hand. Don't raise your hand unless you mean it. Will you respond? Okay. That ain't everybody, but that's pretty close. See, that's all God wants. God doesn't need my preaching. He doesn't need your singing. He doesn't need... God just needs somebody that will just respond and open up their heart and turn to him and say, I'm sorry, and ask him to come into their heart and then walk with him every day in obedience. If God says, don't eat off that tree, then don't eat off that tree. If God says, don't murmur and complain about the people you work with, then don't murmur and complain about the people you work with. If you start to say something and God gives you a Holy Ghost, whoa, then whoa, then stop. If God puts it in your heart and gives you a Holy Ghost, go, then go. You see what I'm saying? I just want to be a part of the body that works. There's a phrase in the Bible It can be found in Hebrews, Isaiah, Psalms, 1 Samuel, Joshua, Deuteronomy, and Exodus. The phrase is hard in your heart. It says today, God says today, if you would hear my voice, please don't harden your hearts like the people of God have done in all these accounts, in all these Bible chapters in all of these times, please don't you harden your heart. God wants to communicate with you and I. That's what I want to talk about tonight. God wants to communicate with you and I. 
Since the very beginning, God has wanted to commune with you. He's wanted to have fellowship with you and me. But there's something that stands in the way. And that something that stands in the way is that he is a gentleman. And God will not force himself on you. And if he whispers to you in your heart, and you do not respond. Do you know what happens to your heart? Your heart becomes hardened. I used to cook a lot commercially. And what I found out was that people with me, my hands got so tough and so callous that I had to tell people, just because I touched it, don't you touch it. Because I could grab things that would burn anybody else. But I'd done it so many times, my hands became tough and my hands became hard. If you're a farmer, you probably got grizzly hands. If you're a rancher, if you're a mechanic, you probably got hands that are tougher than your wives and tougher than most men's. That's because that's hard and that's not a bad thing. But that same thing can happen in your heart. And when your heart becomes hardened, God is whispering to you and you, you, you don't even get it. You don't even know it. Most people today don't believe the Word of God that says that God is the same. Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. That's what Hebrews says. But most people don't believe it. There are places today that don't believe the Bible when the Bible says that some are called as apostles and some as prophets and some as evangelists and some as pastors some and some as teachers. And the reason they don't believe it is because they judge the Bible by their own experience. And so because they haven't seen an apostle, then God doesn't call apostles. And because they haven't seen what they think is a prophet, then God doesn't. And so it's not the Word of God that stands. It's their opinion of the Word of God that stands. And churches get haywire and cattywampus all off kelter. And they're so far from God and God's calling for them. And they're going, what? I didn't hear anything. Because their heart is hard. My wife and I, years ago, passed a church. I mean, you and I should have such a church building. I mean, whoa, it was something. And he had a great big marquee. And on the marquee it said, there are no sinners, no need for a Savior. I'm not making this up. How do you get that far from God? I can tell you how. God whispers to you, and you don't respond. God prompts you and you shake it off. God leads you to a ministry opportunity to somebody and because of the way they comb their hair or the way they dress or the way they smell, you refuse it and your heart gets hard, it gets hard. You quit reading your Bible, you quit witnessing, you quit praying, and your heart gets hard, gets hard, gets hard. And then somebody in some political party says, vote for me, and we're going to kill the unborn babies. And you go, well, I don't think that's good, but if that's what everybody's for, I guess it's okay. And you just go like a lamb to the slaughter, stupid, and so hard of heart that you can't tell that God's up there crying out for righteousness in the land and you're going well I don't know because our hearts get hard and the end of that journey is there's no sinners and there's no need for a savior you turn from things you begin to do unnatural things with your body oh I could go on and on and on it all starts in a simple place in a little place where God had something he wanted you to do, God had something he wanted you to say, and if you responded, your heart was tenderized, and you're prepared to hear him again. But if you don't respond, your heart is hardened a little, and it's harder to hear next time. And I want to tell you something. It can happen in days. You can harden your heart so much in days that you, that you forget you're not even able to hear God. And so, then you know what you do? You have church according to your understanding of the book. 
You say that you walk in grace, but it's not grace you walk in. You walk in your understanding of what the book says. But you live without life because the God who is life, who wants to live in you, you won't allow him to have his way in you. Now, God's really in my heart, and I'm not fussing at you. I love you. Amen? Amen. 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 See, I don't want, I didn't come to skin sheep. I don't, I'm not a sheep, I can't say it. I'm not a sheep skinner. That's not in me. I want that you have life and that you have it abundant. You know what? Several of you have told me that you have begun to experience that woe in your life. That you start to do something and, and you sense that's God and so you don't do it. Let me tell you something. Revival's already begun in your heart. Some, some of you have already told me that you obeyed the Lord in some little thing and then you saw God do a blessing and you went, whoa. Listen, God's already begun revival in your heart. All you got to do is stay on the road. All you got to do is keep it up. Let God be God and God will bring you a revival. God wants to communicate through the heart. That's where he communicates from. It's not the ears, not the mind. Not the intellect, it's the heart. Turn with me in Jeremiah, if you would. Jeremiah chapter 31, verse 31. This is Old Testament. This is before Jesus became a man and came to the earth. This is prophesied way before its time, but it shows us the heart of God. Here's what it says. Behold, days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Verse 32. Not like the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, my covenant which they broke, although I wasn't a husband to them, declares the Lord. Verse 33. But this, put your spiritual antenna up, but this is the covenant which I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. Now listen to this. I will put my law within them and on their heart I will write it and I'll be their God and they'll be my people. When God says, I'm going to be their God and they're going to be my people, what's happening? God says, I'm going to put my law on their heart. Now, there's a problem right here. Some people think that the Bible's full of discrepancies and full of errors. And it's things like this that I'm going to go to next that gives them fuel. The problem is, there's nothing wrong with the Bible. It might be something wrong with your heart. It might be something wrong with your understanding. There's nothing wrong with the Bible. Jeremiah earlier in 179 stay in jeremiah just go just go left a little bit to 179 now when i read this you're going to go oh oh, yeah i know that yeah i know that jeremiah god told him and he wrote this down the heart is more deceitful than all else and is desperately sick who can understand it now maybe you maybe you're like me and you memorized it in king james and it said the de- heart is deceitful and desperately wicked who can know it okay now we got a problem god told jeremiah earlier the heart is deceitful and it's desperately wicked it's dark it's full of awful things and then later God told Jeremiah that the time's going to come when he's going to write his law on the heart. So something's got to change, amen? Amen. You think God's going to take a nasty old filthy heart and put his precious perfect law in it? I don't think so. Something's going to have to happen. Turn with me in Ezekiel. Ezekiel's, keep going toward the New Testament. You're in Jeremiah, next, Ezekiel. Look in Ezekiel 11. Ezekiel 11, verse 19. And God says this. He's talking about a people that he's going to revive. And he says, I'm going to give them one heart. And I'm going to put a new spirit within them. And I shall take the heart of stone out of their flesh and give them a heart of flesh 
so that they can walk in my statutes and keep my ordinances and do them, then they will be my people and I will be their God. Same thing he said in Jeremiah. Then I will be their God and they will be my people. Then what? As soon as God is able to give us a clean heart, as soon as that work is accomplished so that he can give us, he can take out that old stony heart. He can give us a heart of flesh. He can give us a clean heart, a tender heart, a childlike heart. God says, as soon as I can do that, I'm going to put my law right down in their heart. And that is what walking by the Spirit means. That's the shortest, easiest version I can come up with. When God in heaven doesn't, he's not commanding you to keep the Ten Commandments anymore. Now, don't get mad at me. Stay with me. I told our people, and some of them got shocked. I don't worry. I don't spend any time keeping the Ten Commandments. You, they're looking at me like, what? I don't. Because I've learned that if I walk with God by his precious Holy Spirit, guess how many commandments I'm going to break? <coughs> not one. See, the commandments, the rules, the ordinances show you where the boundaries are. Let's say, for instance, we're having a big, a big uh, some fair festival, and, and, and I mark out the boundaries all the way around. And it's a, let's say it's 500 acres, and I got the boundaries all around marked out. And I tell you, come, the festival is going to be within the boundaries. Well, you, you say, I'm not crossing that boundary, but you don't know where the activity is. You don't know where the heart of activity is. You know it isn't on the other side of the boundary, and you go this way, and it's not on the other side of that, and it's not on the other side of that, but you don't know where it is. You know you're in the neighborhood, but you don't know exactly where the activity is going to be. God said the, the, the law is a schoolmaster to us. It shows us our sin. It shows us the boundary, the thou shalt not no matter what happens. But it doesn't bring you to the heart of God. It just lets you know that you need the heart of God. And then when God comes by his spirit and he puts his law within you, now you follow by the Spirit what He puts into you and you find yourself at the very heart, at the very epicenter of everything God wants to do in this moment for you now. You found it. You found the area by the law. You didn't cross the boundaries. But you found the place because of the Spirit of God that led you directly to the heart of God. See, everything I've been talking about, I'm not talking about living some general Christianity. I hope we all live a Christianity within the bounds. I'm not suggesting that we all become lawless and ruthless. and I'm not suggesting that. I hope we all live within the bounds but I hope at the same time that we're not wandering around like bouncing in a pinball machine, running against, whoop, I shouldn't have done that. Whoops, I shouldn't have done that. And we're walking around and we don't know the heart of God. What I'm hoping is that God will raise us up and he'll write his law, his will, his desire for us in our heart so that we don't have to be a human question mark anymore. And we can know what God has for us. And we can be about our Father's business. That's why they got mad at Jesus. God spoke to, God, God led Jesus to go to be with a Samaritan woman at the well. And all the religious people are going, dude, what are you doing here? And he came to her. It was unlawful for him to do that. According to their understanding... Shoot, how many other unlawful things did he do according to their understanding? They picked grains, heads on the Sabbath. That was a no-no according to their understanding. He healed people on the Sabbath. That was a no-no according to their understanding. The problem is their hearts were hard and they brought in the boundaries according to what they believed. They brought in the boundaries according to their tradition. And they were living in that, but they were, they were dead. They were dry. They were cold. And he came to give them life and have it abundantly. And they couldn't realize it. They didn't realize what, what God was trying to do. You remember the story. <coughs> Jesus came, excuse me, 
came to that woman at the well, and he says, woman, if you knew who I was, you'd give me a drink. He who drinks the water that I give them will never thirst again. She said, I know that the Messiah will come. And he said, I am he. At some point along the way, he said, woman, uh, go get your husband. She said, uh, uh, I don't really have a husband right now. Jesus said, you're answering rightly. And, and this is not the first man you've been with. And she looks at him and says, I'm perceiving that you're a prophet. She asked him a religious question. Uh, uh, people do that all the time. When the Spirit of God gets to them and push comes to shove and it's time to make a decision, they'll come out, they'll come out with a question. Oh, yeah, well, uh, okay. Some people say you're supposed to worship here. Other people say we're supposed to worship here. What do you hear? Jesus says, hey, the question is not where you worship because the time is going to come. It's not going to matter where you, where you worship. It's going to matter that the worshipers that are going to worship me later are going to worship me in spirit and truth. Finally, she's going, oh, man. She goes back. This woman that is so nasty that nobody even wants to go get water with her, she goes back into town and says, I met somebody. He's told me everything I've done. She's not hiding her scars. She's not hiding her sin. He told me everything he's ever done. She said, this this, this can't be the Messiah, can it? And they said, Wah. And so they came. Later on, they said, yeah, I think it's the Messiah. But not because of what you said, but because of what we heard. How did God get there? How did, what caused him to go to there in that place in the first place? It was against all tradition. It was against what everybody thought, even his disciples. Friends, God wants to put his law in our hearts. And if we will listen to God, if we will accept that new heart that he gives us, if we'll keep ourselves pure and holy by his spirit, that's the only way you can ever do it. If you will do that, your heart will become tender and God will touch you and God will speak to you and God will work with you and the kingdom of God will come to your family. The kingdom of God will come to your house. The kingdom of God will come to your neighborhood. It will come to your school. It will come to your job. And yes, it will come to your church. Amen. Now, I want to take a few minutes if I can because I am a simple man and I've heard messages before that I know were profound and awesome, but I couldn't figure out how to use it. I tell this illustration, and it's true. Before I was saved, my wife and I, we decided to get a swing set for the kids. So I went to Sears and Roebuck, and I got this maxed out swing set, and I brought it home, and I started to read the directions, but, you know, real men don't do that. And so they got a picture. I can see. Any fool can see how this goes together. And so I start putting it together. Lo and behold, I run out of bolts. I begin to curse, says before I was saved. I begin to curse Sears and Roebuck. I can't believe. They charged me $119. Give me a swing set. That sucker doesn't have these bolts and nuts that I need. So I grumble, I grumble. I go down to the hardware store. I get some nuts and bolts. I come back. I put it together. starting to look like a swing set. Guess what? I run out of stuff again. That's Sears and Roebuck. I'm telling you what. I'm starting to get ticked off about this. And so I go and I get more nuts and bolts. And I get it back. Well, after two, maybe three trips for hardware, I finally get it together. And guess what? When I got together with it, it was a little bit different than a picture there was one leg that was kind of up like that I thought that Sears and Roebuck so I drove a stake in the ground and I I clamped it down now I got another leg that looks down until you swing until you swing until you swing (coughs) well finally I got it done you're laughing like you've seen it I finally got it done. Leave me alone. And then I thought, well, isn't this wonderful? I have all these extra parts. Wow, I could build something with all these parts that I had that I thought they didn't give me. And now I see. Now, I still kind of wonder about the instructions on that swing set. But to tell you the truth, I think their instructions... We're probably right all along. And I think they probably gave me all the nuts and bolts and the little plastic caps that I needed. But what I really needed, I needed somebody older who comes up next to me and says, Hey, 
without the Lord's help, you're getting ready to get stressed out. I've been through this before. Is it okay if I help you put this swing set together? See, I never would have cursed Sears and Roebuck, and our local hardware store wouldn't have seen me two to three times. And when it was finished, I think maybe even all the legs would sit flat. I'm going to do that with you right now for just a few minutes. I've given you the theology of it. I've given you the scriptures of it. But now let's just sit down and build this thing together and see what it looks like. My prayer at conversion was, God, if you've ever got anything you want to do with me, then help me to know clearly what it is. Give me the strength to do it. And then by the strength you give me, Lord, I'll do it. That was my, that was my prayer at conversion. Shortly after I was converted, I used to be a motorcycle rider, an enduro rider through the, through the woods and the hills and hollers and creeks and all of that kind of stuff. And we had been invited, my cousin and I, to join one of the most prestigious motorcycle clubs in the country. And they put on a race called the Black Coal National Enduro. And what we had to do, they'd gone through the woods and they marked about a, about a 90 mile course, 90 to 100 mile course. They had marked it. And what we had to do is we had to go in and cut some of the worst stuff out of the way. So if the motorcycles have to go through here and there's a tree this big around laying all across it, somebody needs to cut that up at least a little and make them a way to get through it. And so if we do this, I think they're going to let us in the club. And so I'm pumped about it. So we get ready. And so the next morning I get up and I've got my motorcycle loaded and I got my leathers out there and I got my gloves. I've also got a chainsaw and I got an axe and I got a machete because we don't know what we're going to need. And I'm getting ready to go. And just before I get ready to go, the telephone rings. And a Church of God pastor calls me. He was the pastor of the church where I'd been saved just not very long ago. He said, Brother Mike, he said, this is, this is Pastor Willis. And I said, yeah, brother. It was early in the morning. He said, I've been up all night praying for you. I said, you have? He said, yeah. He said, he said I'm, I've been so burdened for you today. I don't know what burdened is, but it doesn't sound good. He said, I've been so burdened for you today. He said, are you going to do something dangerous today? I said, no. He said, you sure you're not going to do something dangerous today? I said, no. He said, I've been up a lot of the night praying for you. You're not going to do something dangerous? I said, no. He said, you're not going to be doing something with a chainsaw? I said, yeah, a chainsaw. I'm going to be doing something with a chainsaw. He said, oh, brother, I've been so burdened for your safety all night. He said, oh, can I pray with you? Well, now I'm going, oh, Lord. I'm scared because I'm thinking, What's gonna, what would have happened to me if he hadn't called? And so we pray, and he prays. It's a pretty long prayer. Old believers pray longer prayers. New Christians sometimes get her done in 30 seconds. And he prays a long prayer. And at the end of the long prayer, he says, amen. And I'm sitting there going, shh, now what do I do? And I said, I don't think I should go to you. And he said, well, and I'm going, no, I'm not going. So I called my cousin on the phone who's not a believer. I said, Rex, listen, I can't come this morning. He said, what do you mean you can't come? I said, I can't, I can't come this morning. He said, what do you mean you can't come? I said, well, something's come up. What do you mean something's come up? I got my motorcycle loaded. I got the gas out there. I got everything laid that's hooked up the truck. I'm just getting ready to go. You call me and say you can't go. What's up? So I'm finally saying, look, Red, I said, I don't know if you're going to understand. He said, well, try me. I said, well, okay. A pastor called me and told me that he thinks I may be in danger today. And, and when I told him I wasn't doing something dangerous, he said, are you going to be doing something with a chainsaw? And I said, yeah. And then he said, oh, and he prayed. And then and all of a sudden he got real quiet on the phone. He said, okay. And he hung up. Now I'm getting ready to put all my stuff back up and unload my motorcycle. And the phone rings again. And it's the pastor again. He said, Brother Mike, he said, I've never had anything happen just like this, but he said, after we prayed, my heart is so clear. I, I believe if you be careful, God will help you. I said, what? He said, I believe God will help you. I said, what? You, you think I ought to go? He said, yeah, I think the Lord will help you. I said, oh, no. So now I call Rex back on the phone. Rex, yeah, you got you unloaded your motorcycle? No. I said, I think, I think God's answered prayer, and, and he's going to keep us safe, and, and, and uh, I think we can go. 
He said, well, we don't have to go. I said, I know we don't have to, but I believe we, I believe we could, I believe we'll be okay. And he got real quiet and he said, okay, I'll see you there in a certain amount of time. And now as a new believer, God's been speaking to me and God's been answering me. And I'm going to pray because I believe God's going to answer. And I'm praying, and I'm praying like a new Christian would pray. I say, God, should I take the axe? Should I take the chainsaw? Should I take the machete? Lord, should I take the axe? Should, the, should, should I take the chainsaw? Should I take the machete? I'm believing God's going to tell me. I pray again. Lord, is it the axe, chainsaw, or machete? The Holy Spirit says, Matthew 3.10. I said, thank you, Lord. Should I take an axe, a chainsaw, or machete? Then it dawns on me, maybe I ought to look up Matthew 3.10. It's just a thought. I open it up, and it says, does anybody know what Matthew 3.10 is? I mean, I'll give you a dollar if you do. Oh, now my wife. Come on, that's cheating. Cheaters never prosper. That's in the Bible. No, it's not. So I, so, so I look it up, and here's what it says. The axe is already laid at the root of the tree. I said, oh, Jesus, you're so cool. It doesn't matter if I take the axe or the jeans on machete. God's going to be with me. And so I get up there, and I'm all pumped up. I'm so happy. I stop and got donuts on the way. I'm stuffing these big long johns down my mouth. And I, I get out. I'm so happy. And I get out. Here's my cousin. He's sitting here. I said, Rex, what's the matter? He's sitting there. And he said, he didn't say nothing about me, did he? I said, what do, you, what do you mean? He said, you know. He didn't say nothing about me, did he? I said, no, Rex. God didn't say anything about you. He said, Phew. He said, it's because I've been watching you. He said, oh, it seemed like all my life I've been following you. You do something and something happens to you. And then before you know it, I'm doing the same thing. And now I see this happening with you. And I'm wondering, am I next? And. I'm just trying to understand. The kingdom of God that day came to where two riders are parked and one rider who didn't give a flip about God suddenly is concerned for his welfare, his soul, and his future because some saint of God in the middle of the night has his heart so burdened for some new believer that he doesn't know what to do and he prays and obeys and the kingdom of God comes. Amen. I've only got, I'm going to, I could go for hours and I'm not going to. I'm, I want to share one more thing. I can't see that clock and that's probably a blessing. For me, not for you. I want to share one more thing with you. God will work with you in ways different than even if I told you hundreds of things he had done for me, the next thing God does for you, it would be something that I didn't prepare you for. Because God is God enough to speak to you in ways that you know and in ways that you can understand. Sometimes God will speak to you through people. Sometimes God will speak with you directly through his word. Sometimes God will speak through you to you through a pastor's message or or a word in a hymn or in a song that you're singing. Before I was saved, I never wanted to do anything except wild things. After I was saved, God gave me a new heart. And one day I just been saved just a little while, a couple weeks. And the Lord impressed upon me in my heart that he wanted me to have a garden. And I said, oh, Lord, okay. To me, having a garden was like taking up knitting. <clears throat> and then I thought, okay, I got a way out. I don't have a tiller. I said, okay, Lord, I hear you. I have a garden, but I don't have a tiller. If I had a tiller, I could have a garden, Lord. Amen. So we go to church. And the Sunday school superintendent is a friend of mine. And he says, out of the blue, Brother Mike, uh, uh, have you ever thought of having a garden? And I said, well. He said, I got a tiller. 
I said, uh-huh. He said, you could come get it. I'm not using it. I said, oh, thanks. He said, I got to come to Owensville this afternoon. I'll just bring it over. How about that? I said, oh, no, I couldn't say hallelujah. I said, okay, okay, thank you. So I'm going, Lord. See, I didn't know God did stuff like that. But my heart had been revived. And now these things that sound so strange, so unusual, so now they become commonplace. Jesus said, my sheep hear my voice, they know my voice, and they follow me. Hear my voice, know my voice, and follow me. That's what Jesus said. The Bible says, as many as are led by the Spirit, they are what? the sons of God, the children of God. You see, it seems unusual to some of us, but it's normal and regular to God. It's what he's intended for all of us. (coughs) He brings me this tiller. (coughs) It's a Troy built, one of the old Troy builts. You know, it takes two men to do anything with it. so heavy. I gassed that thing up. He showed me what to do. I fired it up. I got to tell you, the joy of the Lord is going to be my strength, but not right now because I'm kind of dragging my feet. I've got a third of an acre of a lot <coughs> next to our house, and I start tilling. And at first I'm tilling, and, you know, you got to learn how to do it and everything. Pretty soon that thing starts eating, and I start seeing sod. I start getting happy. I start thanking God that he put it in my heart to have a garden. And even though I didn't want how he put it on his heart, said, yeah, i got a tiller. And then he brought it over, and now I'm tilling. And pretty soon the more I'm tilling, I just get happier and happier and happier. And I kept tilling and tilling and tilling. And then it, three days later, I'm up against my neighbor's fence. i got a third of an acre tilled up. I haven't planted anything. I don't know how to plan anything, but I'm telling you what, it's a good thing he had that fence. (laughs) When the Bible says that the joy of the Lord is your strength, you know where the joy of the Lord comes from? The joy of the Lord comes because God speaks to you and you go, what? And you're willing to step through that thing that you don't want to do and you begin to do what God's put in your heart to do. And as you do that, Man, the joy is just, the joy is boundless. I wish we had more time because I'll never get to the end of the goodness of God. But here's what I want to encourage you to do. Seek your own joy. Seek your own experience. Seek that God can speak to your voice so that you can hear his voice, so that you know what he wants. You say, I don't know how he's going to speak. Well, just forget about that. He knows how to speak. You don't have to know how he's going to speak. Just say to God, God, maybe you want to come and pray right now. Say, God, I don't know how to do what he's telling me to do, but I've got a stir in my heart and I want to find out. Or maybe you have to say, Lord, I once walked what he's talking about, but it's been so long and I need it revived. God, forgive me for the hardness that I've let creep into my heart and Touch me right now, God, and tenderize my heart. Take away the calluses and the hurt and the toughness and give me a tender heart, God, so that you can use me again so you can speak to me so I can hear your voice and so I can walk with you like the men and women did of the Bible so long ago. And maybe I'm getting ready to sit down, but there's one more possibility. Maybe you have never, ever given your life to Christ. Maybe you have never, ever, not once committed, sold out to him completely, repented of everything that you know is wrong, and asked God to come into your heart and forgive your sin, to be your Savior, to give you a new heart, and to help you walk with him all the rest of the days of your life. If you are any of those people, I want to encourage you to come down and pray. Would you do that? You told me a while ago, all the hands went up almost. Would you do it? If God spoke to you, would you do it? And I'm asking you now, if God is speaking to you, if your heart is doing something it's never done before, if your soul's got a longing that you can't remember that before, that's God. Respond and let God be God in your life again. And let's experience revival like we have never seen it before.